bit of soundtrack, and the orchestra played the score, which Charlie Chaplin mm -hmm. had written. I know a number of orchestras had done this, but in St. Louis, we allowed the audience to bring in soda and popcorn, mm. and we ran a trailer before the movie, which was from the 50s, telling people how to act mm. in a movie theater. Mm. It was hysterical. It broke down all the boundaries of the traditional how you're supposed to behave in the concert hall. Huh. Now, whose idea was that? It was actually a variety of people. Some of it came out of the marketing department, um, and David Robertson was involved mm -hmm. in the idea. But they had, they had technical difficulties to deal with, like they had to have boxes for the popcorn rather than the bags, because the mm -hmm. bags would rattle. Mm -hmm. Make sure they had lids for the sodas. Um, and there was, for, for David, there was just the problem of coordinating the end of the trailer with the beginning of the score, which involved me because I had the opening notes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> huh. So it sounds like, to some extent, the whole orchestra, the, the whole institution, is at least sometimes getting involved in new ways of doing things to just infuse some more life back into the, the process. I think what David demands of us and what we are able to give him perhaps more than other orchestras, is flexibility. Mm. As an orchestra, I think we, we bring capability and flexibility in style. We are cordial with each other. We've sometimes been referred to as having a familiar relationship between each other. And he's encouraging that. He's asking us to do diverse styles. He's putting us in different environments. We have one series which is in a local art museum, the Pulitzer. Um, the audience sits on steps, and there's a maximum audience of 120 people. Mm. It's a chamber series, and the, the music is chosen, and it's chosen by David to coordinate with the art exhibits, and that will sound good in that space. Mm -hmm. So for instance, I was involved in Copeland's Unanswered Question where the strings were way down there and the flutes and clarinet, because we did that version of it rather than all the flutes, were up on a balcony. We could not see David. And the trumpet was way in back, seemingly in the next gallery. But the effect was magnificent. It's an entirely cement building. Mm. And the sound was just coming from, just flowing in through the locations. So what is the effect of all of this on the musicians? Spirit of experimentation, a spirit of how can we have fun with this and make it really lively for everybody, begins to permeate through the organization. And also, I think it's important to say that since this is David we're talking about, we're talking about somebody who operates at the highest level of musical responsibility. Absolutely. He is the last person Absolutely. who's going to sell out a musical value for the sake of an effect. Correct. But now, does this mean that the musicians catch fire with this, your colleagues, and they're all excited? Yes. Wow. Some, of, some of the performances, I, I walked out of our performance here in Carnegie Hall when we did um, a Debussy Monet. So oh, I was there. You were there. Yes, yes. So it was seeing Debussy hearing Monet. Mm -hmm. And I thought that performance of Afternoon of a Fawn was amazing. I thought the sound of the orchestra was like nothing I mm. had ever been a part of before. And that catches and it keeps growing. It snowballs and it rolls down. It's momentum that's just downright exciting. Hmm. And what do you think that would lead to in the future? I hope no barriers whatsoever. I hope further experimentation. Okay, no excited barriers audiences. whatsoever. What do you mean? Um, normally in creating a subscription series, there are considerations of, is the audience going to come? I hope that our audience will trust us, that this will be exciting enough, they will be able to comprehend it, because David helps. He helps break these barriers. He encourages the audience to be who they are. He does not get upset if they applaud. He does not get upset if they cough. And 
that if they bring a willingness to experience and we bring greater excitement, that the variety of what we can present will be even greater. And this could, if all goes well, answer one of the questions that I see brewing in the background in the current crisis of the American orchestra. And it's, okay, not enough people are coming to concerts. We need a new audience, blah, 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 blah. We say this all the time. Why should anybody go, in fact? What is it that's being offered? And very few institutions could answer that. Right. From the public perception, what do they do? What does an orchestra do? It does play, it plays classical music. And it does that reliably week after week. And that's very nice. And maybe I should go sometime is likely to be the strongest response that somebody gives right. who is not already caught up in it. But now if what you're saying about St. Louis really becomes known throughout the city, people can say, you know, we have an exciting orchestra. You never know what's going to happen it's when you go event. there. They play classical music, but it's different. Right. And it's an event. And David also brings an interest in all kinds of music and a knowledge of all kinds of music. So I was involved in a chamber concert that had Wayne Shorter's jazz group in front, and we were playing with him. But unlike other events similar to this that I've done, we were not the backup band. We were really an mm. integral part of what was going on. We played some of those licks, and they were really hard. Um, and it was an event. It was exciting. It had the audience on its feet. It had the audience applauding after individual solos. It felt like it, a handmade event that was never going to be repeated. Which also gives the orchestra a very contemporary feel because it gets involved with other kinds of music that, dirty little secret, okay, the people who come to orchestra concerts and even more the people one would like to come are listening to already. So right. it really doesn't do to pretend that they now need to be elevated above it. And I have seen, in one case, a conductor of some reputation just dump all over the very idea of pop music as something that was trivia and had to be moved beyond. I saw another, somebody who speaks a lot when he conducts, um, who pretended to be open to pop music, but in fact said the most patronizing things about it. But David is in a very different position, and you, in fact, very helpfully brought to me a printout of the things that, let me see if I get this right, that David programmed on iPods that were raffled off to kids, young musicians who were working with the orchestra? No, it wasn't no. young musicians. It, it was, was actually a sort of preview concert before our opening night was entirely for students. Ah. And they passed out this list of David's 10 favorite downloads and mm -hmm. raffled off some shuffle iPods with these, with these on, on it. Okay, I'm going to read the list. And all I'm going to say in advance is that this is music that David actually knows and loves. All You Have Is Your Soul by Tracy Chapman, Chasing Strange by Liz Wright, Adam's Apple, Wayne Shorter, But Not For Me, Chet Baker. Now we're going back into really classic jazz. My Favorite Things by Outkast, the clean version, it says. I suppose you're forced <laughs> to do that. Tiger Rag by...